So, yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Andrew. Uh, just a bit about where I'm coming from here. I'm a lecturer at Queen Mary University of London, so just down the road at the Center for Digital Music there. Um, just uh, my background is as a composer and an instrument designer, electronic engineer, and so I've, I've been working on this project that I'm going to present here for a couple of years now, first in, at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and for the last year and a half or so here in London. Um, I'm not going to make this death by PowerPoint, I just thought I'd run you through a few of the bits and pieces of kind of how it works, and then mostly make this sort of a hands-on demo session, because I think that'll be a lot more interesting. But just to give you a bit of context, what we're coming from, from here. So the, the idea is that this project is something I call Touch Keys, and it's a multi-touch musical keyboard. And what I mean by that is that you take a standard piano-style keyboard, and affix to it sensors which measure the XY position of the player's fingers along the key surfaces. And then you can use that data of where the fingers touch the keys and how they move on the keys to create new sounds. But the important part is at the end of the day, it still feels like a piano keyboard. You know, it still has the keyboard action. Uh, you, know, you know where the keys are by feel. So if it's you know, something you spent a long time learning how to play piano, you don't have to completely relearn all of these things. Like you might, for instance, if you were playing an iPad music app or if you were playing you know, a, a completely new interface with no reference to a traditional keyboard. So in other words, the motivation for doing this is that we have this huge community of people who play piano or electronic keyboard, uh, organ, or any similar instrument but that there's lots of new sounds that we might want to create, you know, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. And also, you know, that we want to do this in a way that is reasonably flexible to go on different kinds of keyboards, which can be produced at reasonable cost, um, and, you know, all of sort of similar practical considerations. Um, I don't know how many people here are uh, like musicians, electronic musicians. How many people do stuff with MIDI? You? Okay. Yeah. So, if you, you know, so one of the things about the MIDI standard musical instrument digital interface is that basically we've got this standard that's been around since about 1983, and it gives you, you know, sort of a universal language, I suppose, for controlling different synths. But it fundamentally is discrete. Note on, note off. Um, you know, just a little bit of aftertouch stuff in the middle, but not a whole lot of ways of shaping a note continuously across its duration. But the thing is, I mean. Uh, and the reason for this, basically, is that the piano, the acoustic piano, which is where the MIDI standard was inspired by, is actually a percussion interface that we have basically, uh, you know, hammers that hit strings. And so the, you know, the only thing that really matters on the acoustic piano is when and how hard the hammer strikes the string. So if you, you know, do this on a key, if you press into it, you wiggle your hand around, it's not going to do anything on the acoustic piano. So therefore, the standard that most electronic keyboards use, likewise, offers a very limited range of options after you play the note. But I myself play the viola, and uh, you know, one of the things that I am very used to is being able to play a vibrato on a note, for instance. Um, being able to bend the pitch from one place to another, to change the volume of timbre after the note begins. And so it's these kinds of capabilities that I'm trying to bring to the piano-style keyboard with this Touch Keys project. Um, and so, you know, the alternative, of course, is to do something like this, to make an iPad interface where we don't have any of these limitations of the traditional keyboard, but if we do this, we have no tactile feedback you know, from the physical motion of the keys that is so important to people who learn how to play now. Um, so, just a, a, then, just a sort of a little bit of tech tutorial, I suppose. Um, capacitive sensing, uh, I'm sure, is, as you know, has become quite widespread. It's, you know, it's, the, it's what's behind every iPhone screen. Uh, it's you know, on the trackpad of you know, every laptop. And the basic idea here is that you, know, you apply a voltage to a metal plate of some variety. It results in a certain amount of charge on the surface of this plate. And basically, the charge also creates an electric field around the metal plate. And we have this relationship of uh, Q is equal to CV. Basically, what we mean is that the capacitance of this plate, of this quantity that we define, is, sort of the, is the relationship between the amount of voltage we put on this metal plate and the amount of charge that appears on the surface. Now, the thing is that when a finger comes near this charged surface, it doesn't even have to touch it when I'm talking about electrical conductance here. Uh, when, when you put your finger near this particular charged plate, it's going to disrupt the electric field. And what's going to happen is that the amount of charge present here is going to change. And therefore, the capacitance of the plate is going to change. So, um, basically, the idea is that 
we don't actually have to contact a surface for this to work. We don't have to have electrical conductance between the finger and the interface. Just by the finger's presence near this charged surface, it will change the capacitance. And by measuring the change in capacitance, we can then figure out whether or not and where the user's finger is. So you know, some advantages of the approach that we're taking here is there's no pressure needed on the surface, so you know you can buy these linear potentiometers, right? Like resistive strips that will go on top of things. And that's cool, but you need to press down for you know for it to activate. Um, again, as I said, no electrical contact, um, and you can even sense things at a little bit of a distance. So lots of useful things here. Um, just so it shouldn't it shouldn't be claimed that I'm the you know the first person to ever have come up with this idea it was you know originally pioneered by none other than Robert Moog. Uh, who in the early 90s created uh, a prototype of something sort of along these lines, a uh, keyboard that featured touch sensing on the surface, but it was too far ahead of its time. The, the technology just wasn't mature enough, and I think it, had, you know, it was very expensive, and I think had reliability problems, as I understand it, and it just wasn't suitable for production at that point. Fast forward 20 years or so, and now capacitive sensing is ubiquitous and cheap, and we can do this perhaps the way that Moe would have originally intended for it to have been done. Um, and here's the solution. And actually, I'll send. Let me let me send this around if you'd like to have a look. Um, this is this is how it. It's, it's okay. It's an older version. If it gets banged up, it's uh, it's not too big of a deal. I would like it back at the end, but um, what we're doing is putting a capacitive sensing layer on top of an existing keyboard. So you know we retain the motion of the keys by the keyboard that this goes on top of. And then what we do is we put these little sensors shaped like each key just on top of the key surfaces. So as you play, it measures where your fingers contact the keys. Now, what you see here is the sensors as they come produced in a, a, a panel for circuit board production. And then we use pop these out. And then you know each of them is shaped exactly right for each particular piano key. So you put it on the surface of the keyboard. Um, here's just some of the. Uh, sort of uh, low-level details about what this works on. We use, um, so uh, the, this, I guess, supposed being a, you know, a, not just Arduino group, but an Arduino group, among other things. There is a, there is a nice passive sensing library for Arduino, so you can do this kind of touch sensing. Um, this particular chip by Cypress, I actually like rather a lot for this sort of thing. And it's, uh, it's got hardware built in, specifically tailored toward high-res capacitive sensing. So you can get a speed and a resolution that really goes uh, much beyond what you can get with the, like the Arduino-style libraries of capacitive sensing. So you know, we get about 10-bit measurements of each individual pad on these circuit boards, where there are 26 pads on them, every five milliseconds. So you, know, you can you know, kind of work that out. It's quite, it's quite fast and quite sophisticated. These, these little chips cost maybe one pound 50 or something, one of these sort of um, so what I do is basically put a capacitive sensing controller on each key. Now, obviously, you don't see it when you play because it's on the underside of the key. Um, and then what happens? What's on the player's side, um, the part that you know, that that you interact with, is a layer, uh, sort of a network of sensor pads. But then, of course, that's all covered in turn by uh, a resistive layer. So it's not like you're playing on metal. So you know, it has a feel that is textured, but ultimately with a similar kind of sticky slash slipperiness to a normal piano key. Um, and the nice thing about this arrangement, too, is that the size of the instrument can be variable, anywhere from you know, two octaves to a full grain piano size that we've got here. Um, here's some pictures of the early uh, sort of crude green circuit board-ish versions and some experiments that I tried with uh, plastic overlays, um, which from an electrical sort of sensor standpoint worked OK, but actually it was just kind of a mess. So I, it turned out that just the raw, um, just using the right color of solder mask on the circuit board actually produced a really a much better playing experience than this plastic stuff. So I, um, I'm going to skip this video because I've got better ones. But um, basically, here's the design principle of how we measure where the fingers go on keys. Um, this is an earlier version of the black key sensor. And you can see we have this network of 17 sensor pads all kind of interlaced with one another. Um, and what happens is that each of these pads is a little capacitor. And that when the fingers get near the surface, it causes the capacitance of some of the pads to selectively increase. And so what we do is we basically just sort of make a plot of what the capacitance of each pad might be. And from that, we can estimate exactly where we think the finger might be. So we actually get a much better resolution 
um, than just 17 points along the key. So it actually ends up being about a tenth of a millimeter that we can set to. Um, fun stuff, and all of this happens within the keys. The data gets sort of grabs, collected together, and then sent to the computer, um, where it's processed, and then we generate data to control in various sense. Um, we also have a little bit of a trick that involves two-axis sensing, so we get XY um, on the keys. Formerly, in my first design, it used to be XY only on the white keys, and now it's XY on all the keys, so that's great because you can use the horizontal axis to do things like vibrato from side to side, and you can use the vertical axis to like, control synth parameters or maybe to do larger pitch bends. I'll show you a video. And so this is an example just of how I did this with the circuit board design. Four layers, the sensor layer on the top, um, some internal connection layers in the middle, uh, a ground plane on the other middle layer, and then finally on the bottom layer is where the chip lives and the traces. Um, I think that's as much as I'd like to say this way. Um, if you're in, oh yeah, if you're if you're interested in capacitive sensing and designing this kind of sensor circuitry. Um, I've, I've gone through a lot of revisions of this and sort of come up with a set of recommendations, I guess, for things that work well and things that don't work so well. It's, it's a little bit of a voodoo kind of thing because it's, when you connect the sensor pads, it's not just the pad itself that matters. It's the pad and all the wire and trace that comes off of it that is the sensor. And so you need to be very careful with how these circuits are laid out. You definitely can't cross your wires. And you also have to keep your traces short. There's just, you know, there's just kind of a whole trial and error thing about getting this right. Um, I do recommend if you really, uh, you know, if you're very interested in passive sensing in general, these these Cypress chips and a few other similar ones are really nice for this. And they talk by, you know, I squared C or other protocols. So you know, you can use them in, uh, you know, uh, an Arduino or other microcontroller context. Uh, they have their own microcontroller on board, so it's really cool, so I don't recommend using it for much other than gathering the data itself. Um, anyway, that's, um, I think what I'd like to do is show you a video or two of this in action. Here's one that I just, um, here's one that I just made. Um, I'll, I'll tell you about the Kickstarter campaign in a minute, but in the meantime, this is, I've been posting video updates on a more or less weekly basis, and this is the latest one. Uh, which sort of explains how this works in the context of playing classic synth sounds. So what you're going to hear here is the touch keys used to control the parameters of an emulation of the classic Yamaha CS80 synth, which is from 1976. Amazing instrument that had uh, uh, polyphonic aftertouch, which meant that it could measure the pressure on each key independently and should get some really wild effects. Very hard to find on modern keyboards features like that, but the touch keys it works very well. We can just move the fingers around to achieve these kinds of effects. You, you, this particular sound might be somewhat familiar from Blade Runner and other such things. So here we are. <laughs>
the CS80 had a ribbon above the keys that you could use for pitch bends. With the touch keys, we can put the ribbon onto the keys themselves and add vibrato and pitch bends independently on each note. I guess sort of as you saw in the second half of the video I played before, we're moving up and down the axis, the key is good for bend, um, for larger bends, and then the vibrato goes back and forth and stays centered around the right pitch. So here we are. Until now, on the piano, it's never been possible to change how a note sounds after you play it. But on the touch keys, it's really just as simple as moving the fingers back and forth, or up and down, on the key surfaces. The touch 
keys are a sensor kit that lets you add continuous expressive control to the surface of any keyboard. So there are three parts to the touch keys sensor kit. The first is that there is a set of overlays that you stick on top of your keyboard. So they're cut out in the shape of each piano key. You just peel the backing off, put it on the top of the key, and away you go. And then there is some boards that go inside the keyboard itself, which gather all the data from the sensors. No, and then the third part is a software program that runs on the computer. The touch key software works with any program that speaks MIDI or OSC. You just select the touch key sensors and select the MIDI keyboard that they're installed on. Hit start, and away you go. The software lets you map your finger position and the contact area to virtually anything you like. So examples would be vibrato by moving the finger back and forth, pitch bends or control changes by moving the fingers up and down, or extended techniques by using two or more fingers. keyboard with the same familiar action as you had before, but now with the ability to play all of these new techniques just by how you move your fingers around on the key surfaces. We're seeking to raise funding for this, so we're offering the touch keys in two forms. One is as a do-it-yourself kit, where you put the sensors on your own keyboard. But the other option is we're offering pre-assembled touch keys instruments. Once you apply and install the keys, what's behind that? Do you have a board or something? Yeah. To um, fix it all up? Yes. So what we've got here, just so okay. you can see this. Um, so the keys themselves you know, go on top of here. And I found this really fantastic uh, adhesive strip that, you know, that we can laser cut to the right shapes for each key. And it's just the right thickness to go around the parts. And it also has the amazing property that it is like essentially completely indestructible, but then if you do remove it, it actually doesn't leave a residue. So it's like th oh, this, yeah. this kind of, you know, these little plastic doors. Um, and then this board here goes inside the keyboard. And if we, and if we have more than two objects, they daisy chain. And the last one speaks by USB to the computer. So right now it just shows up as a USB serial device, um, but I think by the time I ship it, I'm going to make it a USB video device, because that would just be a little bit more compatible with different OSs. So yeah, so the thing works, I mean, it works with the computer, uh, but Mac, Linux, and Windows, it's all, uh, I don't know if anyone's used Juice here, a really awesome cross-platform environment. This is, this is worth, uh, I don't know about this, if you do C++ stuff, this is so worth a look. It's, uh, it's a guy named Jewel something or other, and he's actually, I think he lives in London somewhere, or at least he's somewhere in the UK. Um, but he's made this incredible set of um, C++ classes, everything from GUIs to signal processing to uh, you know just low-level uh, sort of nuts and bolts, and it compiles to Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, you name it. It's uh, it's very nice. So you write your software in Juice, and then you know you can generate versions of different. Yeah. 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 So I mean, yeah. So I mean, all of these things here, for instance, are, are things are things that are based on juice. I mean, Max MSP is actually based on juice. Uh, so and it's free if you run if your application is open source, which this will be. Then it's free. Um, otherwise, you pay you, you pay two hundred pounds for a license. So with that, let me let me switch this over to the demo here. Let's see if we're still let's see if we're still happy. Basically, 
what I've got on this is um, actually maybe it's easiest for me just to put the input of the software on it. What's that? Can you put every time inputs? Okay, you want to see the software? Or? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, you should plug this in so we can see what's going on. Oh, sorry, that's 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 So you can see that you know it measures where the fingers touch the keys and it's two axis, so. Um, and it's actually multi-touch too. I didn't really get into this, but you can use multiple fingers on the same key, up to three. Um, so if you wanted to assign sort of special meanings, play it out with two fingers and get a different sound, but if you played it out with one, um, that's all quite possible. And so when I have this one back to on the software right now, I've just got a sort of a guitar sound. special about this being pitch and this being a bigger pitch bend or this being filter cutoff. It's all very flexible, so it's, you know, uh, uh, the, the mapping is, the, the GUI isn't quite ready here, but basically the idea is that, you know, um, that you just add whatever mapping from whatever dimension to whatever dimension. So I say, I want the Y position to control, you know, MIDI controller number 33, which my synth interprets to mean, you know, something about LFO settings or something like that. Or I want the relative X position compared to where you strike the note to mean pitch. Or, you know, it, and you just kind of um, add and remove flexibly, and it does all of the rest. So the touch key software is not something that actually makes noise by itself. It's whatever synths you want to hook up to it. So I've just got this, you know, free guitar sound from uh, native instruments, and that's you know, so vibrato that way. And I've got it set so that wherever you start the note, it's worth pointing out. You don't have to all of a sudden play the keys in the right place to play in tune because that would be impossible. So, you know, instead what we do is we have, you know, wherever you strike the note is the right pitch. And then after that, it's a whole step in either direction to get to the end of the key. But again, that's changing. You want it to be a half step, you want it to to make it so that it's, you know, that it's a constant amount of bend per centimeter rather than being a constant amount of bend to the end of the key. It, lots of options. So it's, it's just like an SDK, you can, you've got the juice libraries and you can compile your own C++ code? Yes, um, it's, it's a very full-featured SDK. Um, all the GUI stuff, um, what I use Juice for is I use it for GUI. Um, Juice has some cross-platform implementations of things like threads things like MIDI, um, so that you don't have to compile against P threads on Unix and against something else on Windows or you know, against four different MIDI libraries. So, I mean, I've tried to keep this code actually as self-contained even without using juice as I possibly could because it's very nice just to have, you know, sort of standard C++, but, you know, ultimately you need operating system features like good threads libraries or OSC support or something like that. So, um, this runs on juice and it also uses a library called Liblo for OSC messages. Um, so, if you're into synth stuff, then that might be interesting. Um, I can, I can leave it on this mode, or I can put it into the other synth mode if that's more. Do so you have various voices that you can demonstrate? Yeah. Um, I'd be very interested in hearing a violin or something like that. Yeah. I, you know what? I've got, I've got a violin library over on this one. Um, See, you already mixed new men. I don't know why I have to ask you all the questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, so, well, I mean, just to start with, I've got you know, guitar and electric piano set up here. Um, one of the things that we do, because the MIDI standard doesn't let us bend each note independently, the way it works, you send a pitch wheel message and everything moves all together, and that's not very convenient. So we actually set up these examples where uh, we have, uh, you know, basically just multiple copies of the same instrument and different MIDI channels so that we can do things like, you know, so each key becomes an individual instrument. 
it's not exactly the each sort. Um, it, it's not that we need to have a priori um, an instrument for each key. It's that we might have a band of eight channels, for instance. Every time a key is pressed, it chooses the next available one. Um, so that you know, if we wanted to bend the pitch, you know, if we want to do things like this, you know, that you need two different MIDI channels for that. But if all you're doing is like the synth video that I showed at the beginning, you can actually do that on one channel to MIDI support. Mm -hmm. So if you focus enough on the software, can you do almost like 10 fender and the pitch bend? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, you know, <laughs> I'm not telling it's going to sound good, but you know, yeah. yeah. Well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you know, for me, I mean, one of the fun things is that you know, if you pull them, you hear that kind of beating. It's, it's, it's kind of. It's, it's a fun, you know, it's a fun thing to be able to bend the notes independently because you know, then you can start to do you know, uh, kind of impossible tunings and things that you know, wouldn't normally sit on the, the 12 notes of the keyboard all that nicely. Um, another thing that I'm interested in working with, and, um, this is one of these things that's, that's kind of like lost in the crufty old bits of my code, so it needs to be modernized, is a kind of mapping whereby um, you essentially split the keyboard in half. So you get the key here, you get like a quarter tone higher than you get here. Or you know, maybe you have like, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, a, Classical tuning from a, you know from a from a different tradition like you know uh, some, you know Turkish scale some variety that you know would have different microtones in it and you can choose depending on where you get the key which microtones you get so that you have more than twelve notes to pick from essentially um, and then you know you can do that but you can also you know basically combine it with the ability to do vibratos and bends and such afterwards so there's you know there's a lot of flexibility and I think that's one of the messages that I want to get across here is that you know built this sensor hardware kit uh, with the goal of acting like a keyboard, feeling like a keyboard, doing all of the same things that a keyboard normally does, because you have to start with that. And then at that point, it's really, you know, it's just data, right? You know, it's, you know, it's X and it's Y, and you can do things like find out when the note starts and when the note stops and how fast the finger is moving. And it's all at that point up to you in terms of kind of uh, how the data produces sound. So it's going to ship with a bunch of pre-built options, you know, like you know, like these mappings that you can just sort of add, like little you know, blocks, the vibratos and the bends and the and the synth, you know, after touch stuff and the split keyboard and all those things. But you know, I hope this is the sort of thing where to really build a community around this, we start to see lots of new options coming out there and you know, lots of sort of new uh, new types of music being made where you know somebody might think, well, you know, what I could really do is if I you know, move my fingers in this crazy way that something interesting would happen and then see it done and see it done in video. Presumably you've still got the dimension of the velocity and the uh, Yes, <laughs> right, exactly. So we still have the dimension of the key velocity and that's really a handy thing. Um, you know, and so you know, that does what it usually does. And actually for some instruments, I mean this one being one of them, it actually does have an aftertouch in it, which means that as you push, push pressure down on the keys, um, you'll get another reading out of that. Now, most most modern keyboards, so the, the old classic CS80 had that independently for every note, so that's what's called polyphonic aftertouch. This would be called channel aftertouch, and basically there's just one big resistive strip in here, and when you push on it, it doesn't matter where, you get one reading for how much pressure there is on the keys in general. Um, and so, I, but if you, in, the, in the Kickstarter video, you hear a little, um, at the beginning, there's some trombone side I was using. I was using the pressure to do a little bit of a growl effect on the trombone, so you can use the pressure alongside the, the X and the Y data. So it, you know, it becomes quite flexible. But I think, you know, I've designed this in a way to try to make it, sort of take advantage of the intuition, because this is just, it's just such a natural gesture. It's very, it's very easy. I kind of, you know, spending enough time with this now, I find myself going home to my acoustic piano and, you know, doing this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it work that way. So, this is like the learning curve, so like for a good keyboard player. I think it's pretty quick. Um, I th so there's always a learning curve to a new instrument, right? And the, the 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 whole idea of doing it this way with these keys, rather than you know doing something like there's an instrument called the Hocken Continuum, which is an amazing piece, of, you know, uh, you know, musical instrument. It's got sort of a three-dimensional control surface. Uh, the Roland Seymour, also from this area, is another really amazing instrument that does this kind of stuff. Um, 
they, you know, they kind of, um, they, they take an entirely new approach on what it means to play a keyboard like instrument. But here, I'm trying to keep the limit curve really, really short by basically making it so that you only need to do anything new when you want to add a new sound. And if you want to play like you did before, you don't have to really want to do that. So I think that's, I think that's important, you know. So, we, I did some studies, you know, because this is partly an academic project, perhaps, you know, perhaps mostly an academic project. Um, I did some studies in the fall with, uh, back uh, about nine months ago, with some players from the Guildhall School of Music where we tried a few different techniques and you know, just to sort of evaluate how useful they were. And it came up, came up quite nicely with how they were able to control the high degree of accuracy when, when the new techniques engaged versus when they didn't. So, yeah, so I, th I think it's pretty, I think it's a pretty memorable sort of thing. Any other questions for Benjamin? I know the, there's only very few people on Kickstarter, but you've got good progress. Is that sort of you're being bankrolled by uh, one or two big players? Or well, okay, it so, so... I'm quite intrigued by that. Yeah, I'll, I'll switch back to this. Um, <laughs> the thing is, and this is, this is a benefit, I mean, this is, I've asked for 30k on this, and you know, as you know, um, uh, you know, when you're familiar with Kickstarter, the deal is you either get there or you don't, right? So yeah. 29999 means nobody has charged anything and the project is off, right? And you know, at that point, it's a sort of a step change. Everybody, you know, everybody is whose pledge is charging 30k, and then the whole project goes forward. And that's exactly what you need for something like this, where if you got half as much as you needed, then everything would cost a lot more to make if you wanted to go down. But um, the way that so we have 109 backers and. Um, just uh, sort of 15 point something K right now. The, the main reason for that is that really what I'm trying to do here is get these uh, is get these instruments out there. So they're not, you know, well, you know, let's be clear. I mean, they're not super cheap, right? They, they can't be because it just costs money to make. But when somebody wants an 88 key grand set of these, you know, that'll be like you know 1,100 pounds or something. So you don't need that many people to get. Okay, so there's a real, um, there's sort of a long tail distribution in what's happened so far. We've got, you know, a few people pledging the, you know, the larger instruments, and then, you know, a rather larger collection of people around this area, kind of the smaller set. I just added one more thing above this, that sort of 195 option for one. Um, you know, that, that hasn't been live long enough, really, for to get to take up yet. But then there's, you know, and then at the top there's the usual kind of small stuff, you know, I, for, for 25 pounds will laser etch a, Pint glass with you know the keys and the you know you know crazy fun stuff and you know so the, yeah so that's that's kind of how this works. Yeah, just another quick question. But yeah. on the, uh, well, so, so the pricing in the long term, yeah, if you do hit the target goal, you will be being kind of gradually trying to get it more affordable. It's it's a hard question that um, I think. So if we do hit the funding goal, then the first priority becomes manufacturing these and getting them out there. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not intending to have like you know a web shop up to take orders and you know sort of uh, at arbitrary times. I've talked to you know I've had two different friends do projects kind of like this sort of thing where they had to make a bunch of hardware uh, as a one-off initially, and then they you know, continued on after that. And I think both cases they, they had a great experience the first time around when they got everybody together, did the pre-orders. You know, neither of these were Kickstarter, but you know, it was the same idea. They got all the pre-orders together, did the run, it was out there, everybody was happy, it was brilliant. And then they said, that's great, let's keep doing it. And then you know, either they would do something, and then they would go like, you know, just sort of get a few pre-orders and then do a huge, big production run again, and then find that they had all this inventory sort of sitting on, you know, on, on the shelf. So it's, yeah. it's a hard thing. Um, I think you were saying truly amazing there. Absolutely yeah. mind blowing. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned you're doing all sorts of things that MIDI can't do. And the best thing, uh, I love the fact that you're actually cheating on MIDI to do that. Yes. Um, there become, I think, you know, there, there are a few instruments out here, you know, the World of Seaboard being another one that, uh, uh, that hit these problems where MIDI, you know, you have. Pitch bend is the entire set of notes on the channel, so I mean, it's, you know, it's a whammy bar, right? So it's, you know, I mean, that's, that's okay, but it's not that great. And so the way that we cheat is basically to give every note its own MIDI channel. In the old days, 
16 channels of MIDI would have been used for drums on one and keyboards on another and bass on another. But now it's keyboard and keyboard and keyboard and keyboard and keyboard, keyboard, right? And if you need even more channels than that, you use multiple MIDI ports, which we can also do with software because it's really easy. Or, you know, or if you had an outboard hardware set, you could do the same thing. Um, it would be very nice, and I would find it very inspiring if there was a way to just kind of chuck out the whole protocol to begin with. But the problem is then you're kind of limited to whatever sounds you can make in Maximus P. And some of that stuff is great, and a lot of that stuff is great, and especially if that's like, you know, if that's really part of your work as a creative artist. But if you want the latest great plug-in from some commercial manufacturer, it's going to speak MIDI. You know, it's kind of like you have to, you have to hack it somehow. And so polyphonic aftertouch is one thing which has been supported for a long time, but then this MIDI channel arrangement is the other one. Just, you know, just what you can't do with MIDI, you can do by just making lots of copies of the same thing. And it's, it actually isn't that heavyweight in terms of, you know, CPU usage. You, men you mentioned um, a cable called a CS80. Yeah. So CS80 is, uh, the CS80 was a classic analog. It was like one of the first polyphonic analog synths made by Yamaha in 1976. And, um, Beast of a machine, uh, you know. I think it weighed about 90 something kilos, and uh, I think it was extremely expensive. It's still expensive to acquire because now it's scarce. Uh, but you know, it had some really classic sounds, and you know, this, and this musician Vangelis was one of the guys who kind of put this on the map. So it's a Blade Runner soundtrack, and it's uh, you know, it's not, and there's, there's, there's some real like you know, the, the sound that I played on that video, I think, is something that a lot of people will hear that and they'll be like, ah, oh, yeah, that takes me back to. <laughs> this sort of, but and it's just you know it's just such a beautiful there's such a beautiful sound about instruments like that I mean there's something so almost kind of vocal and natural about it so it's it's a lot of fun to play and, you know, I don't think really have one here but it's nice to be able to control it in the same way. So your your device can that you said there was a feature that was quite unique to the CS80. Mm -hmm. Can your device emulate that? Yes. Um, the feature that is unique. Well, several, I mean, the sounds are quite neat, but they've been emulated very nicely by this company, Arturia. Um, the, the playing feature that was unique to CS80, or you know, relatively scarce, is this polyphonic aftertouch where every key measured its pressure independently. You just can't buy keyboards anymore that do that. Although there's another crowdfunding campaign out there, not by a company in Germany, that is, you know, that is doing something. Uh, you know, trying to make a keyboard that resurrects that feature. But what I can do with the touch keys is basically just move the finger, is, is instead of using pressure on the keys, um, oops, switch on here. Sorry for the switch. Um, instead of using pressure on the keys to do those controls, we just move the fingers up and down on the keys. So for instance, starting here, that would be like no aftertouch. And then as I move up, the aftertouch is effectively equivalent to putting more pressure on the keys. And to be honest, I think that's a better ergonomic experience than aftertouch anyway. I mean, people say that one reason polyphonic aftertouch never took off is because it was so expensive. I disagree. I think the reason that polyphonic aftertouch didn't take off is that it's really awkward to, it, to exert a lot of force on different fingers. It requires your hand to be very tense. And, you know, I was playing, even just with channel aftertouch, just with one note, playing that demo video that I did for the Kickstarter campaign, uh, you know, of course, because I'm not a great keyboardist, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I had to do a bunch of takes before I was happy with it. I think I'm really sore just having to push on my key over and over again. And that just doesn't happen here when you're moving the fingers around. It's just, it's just very natural. So, so yeah, we can sim you know, we can emulate that capability, but in, in a way, I find it a little bit more controllable. Maybe just a one last question. Sure. Should yeah, sorry. Any here. interest from any of the uh, manufacturers? Um, definitely. Talk to a couple of people is probably not something I can really sort of go into all, all of the details about. Except, I mean, yes, I think it, I think it, there is a potential for this to have a home in, uh, you know, built into a keyboard at some point. And actually, this is one of the things that's come up on the Kickstarter a lot. I've gotten a lot of you know, nice feedback that says, oh, this is really great. You know, I can't wait to see this built into every keyboard on the market. And, you know, the, the answer is, I think, to that is that, you know, A, it's it, it's not there yet, right? You know, I mean, maybe eventually, but there's certainly nothing around the corner. It's not like you know, six months from now we're going to see, at least that I'm aware of, nobody's you know going to use this particular technology in you know in the first half of 2014. Right? So 
uh, quite fun. Yeah, have you considered lending this to something like something like Abbey Home Studio or something where those big artists who mm. be using stuff? You know, just as a as a sort of sample. Or, I think I think I'd like to do that and the and. Part of the answer is that's why I'm doing the Kickstarter campaign, is to have enough of them out there to be able to do things like that. So I can have one and a few other people can have one. But you know, the, first, the first part of it has to be made. So yeah, maybe there's, you know, so maybe there's, so if I'm just, yes, yeah, so then I guess just find an answer to the question. There is a possibility to, you know, potentially see keyboards like this manufactured by others in the future. Uh, there would be some engineering issues to work out, and the other thing would just be, my guess is that the first one of those things that you see is likely to be on the highest of the high end of whatever keyboard. So you know, I, I don't think that working with a with a company is necessarily going to do better in the price department. Well, there had to be a first, yeah, and there had to be a first. Mr. Sachs had to make, make his first musical instrument. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. And you wonder how many you wonder how many others have quietly come and quietly gone, and nobody's ever heard of them. Well, it's, you know, there's the musical field. Certainly, literally, all sorts of ideas. Okay. <coughs> well, I mean, th 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 things yeah. that have stayed and actually actually stayed as well ones, things like pheromones and things like that, yeah. which were which were way out in front of their in their day, but have never gone anywhere. It's true. They they get you know I think things stay around when they get taken up by the right positions, and they go big when they get taken up by enough positions. But it's you know. Not every music, I guess not every instrument is going to be used by everybody, but I, I think there's some potential here for you know for keyboards to really be able to do stuff. So. so you actually need a keyboard. What's that? So you actually need a keyboard. Could you just stick them? You could just stick them on your table or on a board if you like. But for me, I mean, you know, it'll work just as well. But you know, it's it's, it's nice. It's, it's